All right, everybody. Um, hello, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm Greg Swazer. I'm with the University of Minnesota Extension's Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. And uh, today we're going to be talking about deep winter passive solar greenhouses. This is a new, relatively new, exciting technology that has a lot of promise in Minnesota, and a lot of people are getting excited about this. A lot of small and medium scale vegetable producers around uh, the upper Midwest are learning about this and asking lots of questions. And uh, university researchers are uh, in more increasingly getting interested in uh, coming to us for our work in this to see what's going on. So um, just to go a little bit of history, our uh, deep winter greenhouse work is a prime example of our regional partnership model uh, where we connect sustainable development and innovation developed in the community to uh, university expertise for the benefit of both parties. And specifically, the regional partnerships, we develop community university partnerships around the focus areas of uh, sustainable agriculture and food systems, clean energy, uh, community resilience and tourism as one, and uh, natural resources. So tonight we'll be talking about uh, this deep winter greenhouse technology, uh, how it works in some of the projects that have been underway in the past uh, several months and even a few years. We'll have horticulture student, uh, graduate student Liz Perkis talking about her work with our uh, MinDrive Global Food Ventures project, Reinventing Local Foods in Minnesota, where she uh, compared deep winter, uh, uh, deep winter greenhouse production to conventional greenhouse production, some crop, crop research going on there. And we'll have Dan Handeen from the Center for Sustainable Building Research, who's been working on an extension block grant to study the uh, production or the performance of the building technology of deep winter greenhouses to figure out how to tighten that up and make them more energy efficient. And then I'll be talking about the regional partnerships work connecting deep winter greenhouse producers to the university and some of the projects we've been doing over time. Afterwards, we'll be having a reception outside in the atrium, right out those doors. And towards the back, there are some posters and some uh, handouts and some things to look through. Um, we'll have uh, uh, some of the people who've been involved with passive solar and deep winter greenhouse technology for a long time will be around to chat with. We have Carol Ford here, who is probably the first passive solar deep winter greenhouse producer that we know of anyhow in Minnesota who's uh, helped spearhead a lot of this work. And we also have uh, Ryan Pesch up there who's an extension uh, educator out of uh, central Minnesota who's done a lot of work on economic feasibility studies or economic uh, analysis of deep winter greenhouses. And uh, we might have James Boyd Brent here too. Um, I don't see him. He, he may show up in, at the um, reception. We've worked with him and his students to do some design issues or a design around uh, the containers, some uh, produce boxes for the deep winter greenhouse product. Um, some really interesting stuff going on. So please come to the reception, chat with us, flag us down, ask us questions, and we'll have some questions and answers after this too. But so um, to start off, I'd like to provide you some background of, about deep winter greenhouses, what they are and what we've been doing. So uh, very quickly, a deep winter greenhouse, uh, Dan will talk a little bit more about how they work, but a deep winter greenhouse quickly is a, a Passive solar greenhouse oriented east-west with a south-facing uh, glazing wall right up there. You can see up here that optimizes solar heat, stores it in a thermal mass rock bed under the ground where it's, uh, where it's able to emanate back up into the air throughout the night in the non-sunny periods. So um, th these are done to limit the use of ec um, extra fossil fuel heat. So propane, natural gas, other heats, this is uh, intended to do to create an energy independent system where you can pre, uh, produce crops without relying on fossil fuels. And whether or not it works, you can see over here, this thermometer up in this passive solar greenhouse, deep winter greenhouse here, is at about 100 degrees. So without any propane or any natural gas, we can see that when the sun is shining, these things get really, really hot. And so we know that they work and we've uh, done some research and seen them happen So as we go on. So how it all began, um, about, Oh, I'd say about 10 years ago, uh, we had Carol Ford and Chuck Wabel out in Milan, Minnesota, uh, looking to create a winter production system that would be more sustainable or more um, uh, resilient than hoop houses, which were blown away on the landscape in their particular area because of the wind. And they wanted to produce crops in the deep winter months that uh, season extension don't reach. And so they uh, rehashed some old Chinese designs that were becoming popular in the 1980s because of a gas price spike happening back then. Uh, looked into how it all worked, figured it out, built one on their, on their uh, land and their farm, and uh, created this uh, Northlands Winter Greenhouse Manual in, uh, in conjunction. It was a collaboration with what is now the Southwest Regional Sustainable Development Partnership. 
And so this manual here has got a lot of, uh, has got, had a lot of legs. People are always calling about this. People are using this to create their own greenhouses and learn how to produce. And we're constantly getting calls to get more of these out there. So um, that was how this all began with the partnerships. That's how we got into this work. And it's, it's grown since then. So the basic principles for the passive solar greenhouse. The idea is to minimize the cost of that external fuel through that passive solar design by taking that heat and using that instead of fossil fuels I mentioned earlier. Um, that's built, their, their greenhouse was built all out of materials that could be found at their local store in Milan, Minnesota, a small town hardware store. You could get almost everything you need except for this glazing wall right here, which was the only thing they had to purchase off site from a specialty shop. So they're part of the community. They build that community fabric. They, they are interactive. They interact with their community to get these things built and to get them operational. The design is site specific, we'll see later. So each site can have their own specific uh, intricacies attached to their greenhouse. And they're using cool, low light crops that are specifically designed to thrive in situations where there's not a lot of light. So they aren't using added lights or added heat. So they're, um, those types of crops, those fruiting crops, your tomatoes, your zucchinis, et cetera, they're not growing those types of crops in there because those need more light than is available in the winter. So we move on. Um, the regional sustainable development partnerships here. Um, our theory of change is that uh, we work to build, uh, we believe that solutions in Minnesota and the world's pressing issues are going to best be solved when we bring community innovation in, uh, together with the knowledge and understanding about uh, uh, with university and scholarly academic ways of thinking. And we build that center court where faculty and community members can meet together. Um, and specifically, we build community university partnerships, as I mentioned earlier, around the areas of sustainable development in local foods and uh, sustainable agriculture, uh, uh, clean energy, community resilience, and natural resources. And this particular project, this deep winter greenhouse technology, really fits well with our, our system because it focuses on a lot of those things. Specifically, clean energy and climate change and related to climate change. On the left here, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I've been talking a lot about fuel. These are propane prices here over the last 10 or 15 years, see, since 2006, I think. Those are drastic swings. And when propane is really expensive, it becomes really difficult to sustain um, a, a greenhouse, a small scale greenhouse with, uh, with propane. And a lot of the numbers stop working with high gas prices. So this is designed to um, uh, utilize energy, uh, energy independence to get over those swings, those drastic swings in propane. And also related to that, we have climate change going on. The climate is changing and droughts are getting longer and drier. And in California here, the Central Valley here, which is in its fourth year of exceptional drought, or fourth year of drought, I should say, the Central Valley is producing 50% of our nation's fresh fruit and vegetable crops, 70% of our nation's um, uh, processed crops. And then you extend that drought into Washington and Oregon, that number comes, becomes bigger. So this de deep winter greenhouse is designed to create redundancy across the landscape so that we can deal with these when produce prices go up beyond the 20 or 25% they're currently going up because of this drought we'll be able to have produce on the landscape in Minnesota in January, February, March, in addition to all of the other, the other months of the year where we're, we're doing great at growing stuff. Um, food deserts. So um, a food desert doesn't mean that you don't have a grocery store in the rural areas, in the rural food desert. What it means is that you don't have a grocery store that uh, grosses more than a million dollars. So a lot of these food deserts over here not all of them, but many of these food deserts have grocery stores. The problem is that when the price of gas goes up like it did in 2008, a lot of the shipments go down. And so the availability of fresh produce can, become, can decrease when we have volatile gas prices. Passive solar greenhouse technology on the landscape helps create that direct link with your uh, local community. You can provide produce for your uh, rural grocery store in a, in a time where they aren't able to get it from their traditional supply chains. Right now, we have cheap gas, so that's not as much of an issue, but things do tend to fluctuate rapidly. Um, on the right here, uh, this is just showing that uh, uh, this is also a method for farm diversification. Small and medium scale farmers sometimes struggle to make it through. This provides an opportunity to really have uh, cash flow throughout the year instead of just those seven, eight, nine months, depending on what, whether you're doing storage crops, et cetera. So this is really a way to diversify the farm landscape and to diversify farm businesses to make them more sustainable. So real quick, 
this is how it works from the ground up. We have a five foot or four or five foot hole to go below the frost level. You've got a rock bed underneath with an insulated foundation. You've got perforated drainage tile connected to ventilation. And so right on top of that, you dump your soil. You can go directly into that soil and then you've got your ventilation. You connect it to your existing structure here. And then you've got your self-facing gla self facing glazing wall once you're all built up to capture that solar heat, store it in that soil and in that rock bed, and then it comes back up at night when the sun's not shining. And then as they build out, they're ready to grow, growing directly into the ground and then direct, uh, growing into these gutters, these tiered gutter systems so that you're utilizing three-dimensional space. If you notice, some of these, uh, this deep, deep winter greenhouse we've been looking at isn't very big, but it's growing um, vertically. And so on a small-scale veggie scale operation, small-scale veggie operation, that's really important to maximize your space. So then this idea catches on. We've got Ryan Pesh, who I mentioned earlier, is building one on his own farm. I didn't know if you knew you were going to be on this, Ryan, but, uh, but there's your picture. Um, so he took a, uh, um, a, a beach cottage that wasn't being used anymore, had it brought to his farm, plopped it on top of a hill, and then built a gigantic two- or three-story deep winter greenhouse off to the side where he also has some uh, produce storage, some uh, root crop storage also attached to that. Um, and then in the winter, if he has interns, they've got a great place to sleep, and it's nice and warm, and it's got all those uh, fresh growing greens right out there. Here's another one, Paradox Farm. Uh, this is in Ashby, Minnesota. On the left, I mentioned there's a different type of production system. We've got giant red mustard growing in here. The seeding rate is much, much bigger than you might do in a conventional greenhouse, but these are almost ready to be harvested. So you see how densely seeded they are and how they're still thriving. And then one thing I noticed about this picture, you've seen this picture before, but I just wanted to point this out. There are, um, a, you know, a dozen or two dozen people were just talking about this building, these things. There's a lot of room for optimization here. When I was walking through there, I noticed this structure right here. There are two gutters growing side by side, whereas all the rest have one gutter growing side by side. They replicated that. They double their production just overnight, more or less, or over a season without even thinking about it. There's a lot of room to really uh, spread and grow the, the production inside these things. And so then we have more going up on the landscape. These are all a little bit different. Looks like these are freestanding. We've got more coming up. This one is uh, in Montevideo on the left. It's extra wide, and so there's a, a good way to attach that to your existing structure to expand your production capacity by going wide instead of tall. And then on the right, we've got a uh, Lanesboro attached to a pretty large garage. And then there's even more. I mean, these things are growing and growing. It's great. So this is an overview of um, some of our regional partnership work uh, related to deep winter greenhouses. The um, Southeast, our Southeast Regional Partnership worked with the Eagle Bluff Environmental Learning Center and the College of Design in Kira to develop this cold climate greenhouse resource right there. Um, which uh, we've got some copies to look through over there, and it's available online as well. We've got a little uh, card that has the URL you can take right outside on the, on the table. And this, this was a project with Eagle Bluff Environmental Learning Center. They wanted to build a passive solar greenhouse on their, um, on their property, and they wanted to look at a lot of the existing passive solar technology in the upper Midwest, sort of take what was best and combine them. And they're in the process right now of building a pretty large-scale passive structure. It's pretty impressive. Um, we've got an extension block grant uh, that uh, Dan is working with, which he'll talk about, uh, strengthening the building uh, performance and uh, developing construction documents so that others can build these things with easy-to-use, off-the-shelf um, uh, documents. Uh, we have a Deep Winter Producer Association formed in conjunction with the Sustainable Farming Association and the Southwest Regional Partnership from a Bush grant where uh, Deep Winter producers are able to network and talk with each other and figure out how they troubleshoot and they're holding workshops. I think there's even a workshop Saturday, this Saturday, if anyone's interested, talk to Carol afterwards. Um, we had our MinDrive Glo uh, Global Food Ventures project where we worked with uh, Dr. John Irwin in the horticulture department to do some uh, horticultural production research, but also some uh, enterprise analysis and producer profilers, uh, producer profiles, and get some networking structures together. And uh, right now we're embarking on a deep winter greenhouse campaign with support from IONE. We really want to build deep winter greenhouses throughout the state of Minnesota that people who are interested in this technology can kind of go through, open to the public, go through, kick the tire, see how they work, but also have them available for producers to produce 
and the university to utilize for research. So open to the public, open to producers, and open to the university. So we're really hoping that we can uh, get, so we've got a Bush grant pending right now. We're hoping to get some funding so we can go out and build some of these on the landscape for people to go out and look through. And we're also engaging with students with the College of Design. We have students developing those, uh, um, designing those packaging, and they're really able to envision what this product will look like going forward into the future and how it ties into Minnesota. All those examples are out there also on the table to look at. There's some pretty neat designs. Um, here's an example of our networking we're doing. We have this Facebook page, which um, has actually been a really valuable tool. We've got people, um, it's a group, so anybody comes in and, and can network back and forth. People are posting pictures of the greenhouses they're building. People are asking questions. We're finding people building greenhouses in the middle of North Dakota that we never heard about before, and people all over the place. It's really a great, uh, a great place to go. And um, there's a link. There's also a sheet out there you can get that has links to all of this stuff. So you can join this if you want and join in the conversation. We had Ryan Pesch look at the economic performance. He looked at seven greenhouses that he was able to um, talk with throughout Minnesota, and some of his big findings, which he'll talk with you out there in front of his poster, was that people are doing this for a lot of reasons. We've got people doing this for educational purposes, tied with uh, pri uh, private schools and high schools. We've got producers doing this and doing full-on production. And we've got people doing this just kind of to research and see what they can do. And so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of range of the uses for these things going on right now. But the median construction cost we found is about $20,000. And we're using that I mean, as a, sort of a benchmark for how much it might cost to build one of these. And net earnings inside of these range from $5, negative $5, which you might expect from someone whose uh, primary goal is uh, education, to up to $20 an hour, which is pretty promising, I think, for a small farming operation. People averaging about 10 to 13 hours a week inside of these. So we've got some future needs and research opportunities. So this technology, um, it really does need to be research and refined for performance and production. That's some of the work the regional partnerships are doing right now and that we're coordinating. We're really excited about our possibilities and for this technology. And so specifically, I'll pull a couple of things on here that I'm excited about. The prototypes for deep winter greenhouses across the state will be a great opportunity to really spread the information and knowledge and understanding of this, uh, of this technology. But also on the very bottom, the Natural, Re uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service has an EQIP program, which stands for Environmental Quality Improvement Program, where they do cost share for high tunnels. So new and beginning farmers up, who've been farming up to seven years get, I think, 75% of, uh, of their cost for building a high tunnel reimbursed. Other farmers get 50% reimbursed. If we can get deep winter greenhouses under an EQIP program, think of how dramatically the landscape will change and how the local food systems will change in the future. When anybody can go into their local uh, their grocery store and buy deep winter greenhouse greens and produce in January, anywhere, that would be great. So um, with that, I would like to say thank you for coming. And um, up next, we'll have uh, graduate student Liz Perkis, who's been working with the Department of Horticulture, come talk about her, her work. Thank you. If I clip this here, can you hear me well? Okay, I've got Hello. a quiet little voice, so if at some point you can't hear me, let me know, and I will, I'll fix that. Okay, so I am Liz Perkis. I'm a master's student right now in applied plant science, but this past winter I was working as a technician for the Min Drive funded project where we were looking at reinventing food, uh, year-round food production in Minnesota. And there are a lot more components to this project and you can see um, some of the people who are associated with those other parts up there. So what I'm going to talk to you about today are um, two of the many objectives from that project. Um, the first was to look at differences between existing conventional and deep winter greenhouses across Minnesota. And the other was to see how the greenhouse environment affected crop growth and yield. And we were specifically interested in uh, temperature, light, and CO2. So these are where uh, the greenhouses were located around the state. Um, I want you to pay attention to the deep winter ones, which are the blue letters. Um, we had uh, Garden Goddess, which is Carol's, um, uh, Lita Farm, which is Ryan's, and Paradox Farms, which belongs to Sue Wicca, and I don't think she's here right now. Um, so 
we were comparing those to these conventional greenhouses from all over the state. Um, number six in the star is right here in the Twin Cities. So we chose five different crops to grow all over, um, and we chose them based on conversations with producers, um, restaurant people, and uh, co-op buyers. So these are crops that uh, people are interested in using, and they're also crops that people are interested in growing. Um, we chose a mesclun mix of arugula, mizuna, and red giant mustard, um, which are already grown in the deep winter greenhouse is pretty standard. Um, in addition to a whole suite of other deep winter greens that I'd never heard of before. Um, and you should talk to Carol and Ryan about the different varieties they grow. There are some really cool ones. Um, we also looked at strawberry and kale. Um, and we gave uh, the seeds to all of the different greenhouses and pots as well, so they were growing in standard containers. But we did let them use their own media and fertilizer. So at each site, I took production notes from the growers. Um, I also collected fresh weight at harvest. Uh, they did a lot of that as well. Um, and I recorded temperature and light with these, um, these uh, weather stations up in the top corner. And if you were paying attention in Greg's slide, you could see them peeking out in a lot of the pictures. Um, <laughs> I also took photosynthesis curves, which I'll talk about more later. So here's a little bit of yield data for starters. Um, the green bars are from deep winter greenhouses, and the blue bars are from conventional greenhouses. Um, a single bar represents three successive harvests from a single gutter. So as Greg was saying, oh, are we back? OK. <laughs> so as Greg was saying, um, the deep winter producers grow in gutters. And these are rain gutters that they've cut to a certain size, um, just like from Menards or Home Depot. Um, a rain gutter, the standard size is 40 inches, I believe, or so, around there. Yeah, so um, one again, one bar is three harvests from a single gutter. So the first thing you might notice is that the deep winter uh, site, in this case, produced a lot more than the conventional site. Um, so that's a really important fact because um, it's kind of hard to believe that these spaces with no energy inputs are productive, but they really are. Um, and then that one pound line is just a reference. So I'm sure you've seen those extra large clamshells in the grocery store of mesclun mix. They're about like a foot by six by six. That's a pound. Um, and those run anywhere from five to eight dollars depending on the, the place and depending on uh, in the conventional or organic. So before I show you any environmental data, I want to tell you that there was one really important component that we're not using as well as we could be and it's abundant and free in Minnesota in the winter, and I would like you to guess what that is. It's not snow, but it's close. No? What else happens in the winter? Yeah, it's really cold, <laughs> as I'm sure you all know. But um, so what happens here is these greenhouses actually overheat on sunny days, and it's really important to ventilate. And I'll show you that in the temperature graphs coming up. So this is what a uh, temperature looks like over a two-month period in a conventional greenhouse. Um, you see some really standard oscillations between 50 degrees at night, which they achieve by heating, um, and 75 degrees during the day, which they achieve by heating on cloudy days and ventilating really well on sunny days. This is what a deep winter greenhouse looks like for the same period. Um, and you can definitely see the difference between sunny and cloudy days. Those, when it hovers around 50, that's a cloudy day. And when it spikes above 75, that's a sunny day. Um, in a couple cases, you can see where uh, that rock bed underneath the soil is doing its job. So nights after sunny days tend to be warmer than nights after cloudy days. Um, another thing I want you to see is that it can spike up to 95, which is really stressful for plants. And it can even get above, well above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is extremely stressful for plants. So I think this makes a good case for um, automated ventilation. So as Greg was saying, a lot of these are like added value. These are not people's full-time jobs. So people aren't home during the day to ventilate on a surprisingly sunny day. Um, and I think you could really improve production if you did that. This is uh, another look at temperature. Um, so. On the far side, you're seeing the daily high, which is during the day, and the low is at night. Um, again, during the day, the deep winter greenhouses, which is the solid line, is a lot more variable than the conventional greenhouses, which are the dashed lines. 
Um, and on average, the nighttime is about 10 degrees colder than daytime in a deep winter greenhouse. Uh, but that doesn't really matter because we choose crops that prefer cooler nights. And they actually, a lot of them um, produce sweeter tasting crops under cold nights. Um, you do see a dip below freezing there um, in the daily low on the deep winter side of the graph. And it, it can happen occasionally, even if you're heating. But again, the crops that we choose can handle these small stresses. So before I talk about photosynthesis data, I want to remind you all what photosynthesis is, because I'm sure some of you haven't thought about it since high school. <laughs> um, so photosynthesis is the process where a plant takes sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide and converts it into sugar and oxygen. And the piece I'm going to talk about most is the conversion of carbon and carbon dioxide to sugar, which is also a carbon-based molecule. So the way we measure photosynthesis is with this fantastic machine called the LICOR. Um, it's a clamp that attaches onto a living leaf on a live plant, um, and it creates a small airtight space around the leaf. And inside that airtight space, you have control over light, carbon dioxide, and temperature. Um, so what we do is we measure the amount of carbon dioxide pumped onto the leaf and the amount coming back off, and that difference we consider to be the amount that the plant takes and converts into sugar. So that's how we measure photosynthesis. And I took two different kinds of curves. One is a light curve, where I increased light but held everything else constant. And the other is a CO2 curve, where I increased CO2 and held everything else constant. So this is what a light response curve looks like for kale at the two different kinds of greenhouses. Again, the dashed line is an average of six conventional greenhouses. And the solid line is an average of three deep winter greenhouses. So what you're seeing in the horizontal axis is light increasing. And in the vertical axis, you're seeing photosynthesis rate increasing. So if you follow the curve, it increases a lot quicker in the lower part as you add light. And then it starts tapering off and eventually reaches a maximum. And this is because the plant does not have an infinite capacity to, to do photosynthesis. There is a limit. Um, but we don't usually reach that limit at abundant light levels. And this line is where light that we typically see is in a deep winter greenhouse. Um, if your glazing was pretty dirty, it might be a little lower and you wouldn't get as much uh, photosynthesis happening. And the rate of photosynthesis is really important because that is a proxy for yield. So the more sugar a plant can, can produce, the bigger it gets and the more you can harvest. And this is what a CO2 curve looks like. You see a similar shape where um, on the low end as you add CO2, you get a really quick rise in photosynthesis, and then eventually you get a maximum rate. Um, and again, you're seeing uh, the deep winter greenhouses top out a little higher than the conventional greenhouses. And I'm not totally sure why this is. I have a pet theory, which I'll talk to you after if you're curious, but um, I'm not going to mention it now. <laughs> so uh, this line is where atmospheric CO2 is right now. Um, and this is actually one that you have quite a bit of control of in your greenhouse. Um, especially, so what's really important to know is that on a cloudy day, when the greenhouse is closed all day long, the plants are photosynthesizing and drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere. They actually deplete the level of CO2 in the greenhouses down to tw uh, 200 parts per million or lower. So you're getting a really, like, uh, really um, significant decrease in the rate of photosynthesis happening on a cloudy day. Um, there are a couple things you can do. You could just hang out in the greenhouse and breathe a lot. That <laughs> will bring up the CO2 quite a bit. And in fact, when we were uh, trying to measure ambient CO2 in these small spaces, just being there to set up the <coughs> machine threw off the level. So don't, <laughs> don't underestimate the power of your own breath. Um, <laughs> but if you're not home during the day, and it's not a weekend, there are some other things you can do. You can do a simple fermentation in a bucket. So you just put some yeast in water, give it enough sugar, and that'll give off a lot of CO2. Um, and to give you some numbers, a pound of sugar, which is around two cups, could give you, could double the 400 parts per million CO2 in a space that's about 1,000 cubic feet. So that would bring you up to 800 and get you to that line of saturation where the plant is at maximum photosynthesis rate for CO2. You could also consider mushroom production, and mushrooms give off CO2 as they breathe the way that we do. So I hope that you took a couple things away from this, that deep winter spaces are really, really productive. Um, 
and that it's so important to ventilate on sunny days any way you can. Um, take advantage of that cold weather. Um, and I also hope that you're considering uh, ways that you might increase CO2 on cloudy days only. On sunny days when it's open, it's not an issue. A lot of people helped me out with this project, so I want to thank everyone on that list, especially Carol and Ryan, who let me into their deep winter greenhouses and were home at times during the day that I could take this data. If you have any questions, feel free to talk to me after, or you can take down my email, and I'll answer questions that way, too. All right. On to you, Dan. You guys have the coolest toys. <laughs> uh, my name is Dan Handeen. I'm a research fellow at the Center for Sustainable Building Research. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the design and material um, considerations that go into the deep winter greenhouses as we're moving forward. Um, I'll talk a little bit just about the history and uh, our major kind of design goals. Um, so this is my, how I cut my teeth on the deep winter greenhouse stuff. Um, we were brought in by the Southeast Renewable Sustainable Development Partnership um, to compile this document, um, which, uh, I don't know, this is the best kind of accolade I could possibly imagine. Sue Wicca, who is one of the Deep Winter Greenhouse proprietors, said, you know, and she's a doctor and she's also an educator, and, and she said this was the single best example of tax dollar use that she had ever seen. So, <laughs> so I, I, I you know, I, I'll close up shop. No, um, but uh, this was an, uh, basically it was a broad survey of all of the deep winter greenhouse efforts that are going on, going on within Minnesota. Um, and so it wound up being actually quite a, a variation. Um, there were ones that were verging more on the hoop house side, and then there were ones that were, you know, much more structurally kind of, you know, durable, I guess, is for lack of a better word. Um, and a whole range of scales, um, all the way from you know, uh, you know, a thousand square feet down to three hundred square feet. Um, so, really a broad range. But what it did allow us to do was really see what um, what was out there, what kind of technologies were being integrated, and how well the stuff was working. Um, as a second part of that uh, project, um, we also were um, we developed a, a prototype design, a schematic design for. Um, the greenhouse that's going up at Eagle Bluff uh, Environmental Learning Center. So this is kind of, you know, this is schematic design. This is very early stuff. They have since evolved, and they're bringing in all kinds of different technologies. The scale of it is much different. Um, so um, it has moved quite a far away from, you know, the basic tenets that we would think of as being a deep winter greenhouse, um, which I'll go into in greater detail, going back to what Greg said at the beginning. But, um, so that gave us our, our kind of first entree into really looking at the specific components and what, how we can optimize them, right? Because that's really what we're looking at. Um, so I look at this as high-performance greenhouse design. And this is a great uh, kind of um, combination for me because I grew up on a farm and, you know, started a CSA after I graduated from, you know, my liberal arts degree and, <laughs> and then uh, went back and got my architecture degree. But most of my work has been in high-performance building design and building science. So this is kind of a nice melding of the two. Um, so it's really interesting also because on one hand, you know, I'm talking to the growers and, you know, they're, you know, they're in the dirt, you know. And then there's the architects and building scientists who are coming from this, you know, very controlled, very, you know, narrow ranges of performance for optimization and comfort and, you know, all these humidity considerations and so forth. So balancing those two considerations, I think, really does help inform the other. Um, so on one end, uh, we've got the net zero home, which is, uh, this is a project that um, uh, I did for a class um, at the College of Design. Um, this is a net zero home designed for Habitat for Humanity. It's built in North Minneapolis. But, you know, it's designed for human comfort. Right? We like a relatively stable temperature, um, and we want good indoor air quality. Um, pretty major consideration, right? If we're having this nice, tight house that we can control the environment in, we also need to make sure that we're getting fresh air, right? That was the problem in the 70s and so forth. Um, also designed for year-round use at that constant temperature, more or less. It uses both passive and active solar systems. Uh, there's some uh, storage in there, but that's mainly um, domestic hot water. There are insane amounts of insulation in this house. I'll say that. Part of the reason that we were able to do this was by a generous donation from DuPont Foam. <laughs> um, 
So, I mean, literally, you know, there's like eight inches of, of uh, extruded polystyrene on the outside of this thing. Not something that you would really do ever. Um, <laughs> but uh, so this is one end of the spectrum, right? And this is also designed to generate as much power as it uses on an annual basis. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got the hoop house, right? This is designed for plant survival, I guess. So I'm using comfort for lack of a better word. Um, designed for season, season extension, right? The shoulder seasons, we're starting stuff early in the spring, we're going later into the fall, maybe, you know, some stuff kind of just goes into stasis in the winter, um, but relying pretty much exclusively on passive solar gain, right? Just the sun's heat coming in, it traps it within, you know, maybe one or two layers of, you know, six mil poly, and uh, that's it, right? No heat storage necessarily, right? Nothing to really capture it and, and keep it in there, and no insulation. So these bottom two, are the biggest things that uh, we're really looking into as far as the performance. In the middle somewhere, we've got the deep winter greenhouse, designed for plant comfort and human health, all right? So that's a pretty major consideration. Talking about, um, you know, the indoor air quality issues, you know? This is a greenhouse, but it's a very high performance greenhouse. We're tightening the structure up, trying to keep the heat in. We also want to make sure that when we're tightening that up, we don't have any negative effects on operators, right? Um, designed for winter use exclusively. And that's one thing that I really like to try and emphasize in this. When we're talking about the deep winter greenhouses, it's really designed for those, that niche, right? Those deep winter months, you know, November, December, January, February, maybe into early March, right? Just that section. So we're optimizing for production then. This isn't year round use because it's gonna get too hot, basically, that's what it comes down. But we can talk more about that in a second. Um, Uses both packed, passive and active solar systems. I'll talk more about that. Um, some storage in thermal mass, sensible amounts of insulation. Again, we're trying to optimize this, right? What's our best payback for the investment, both on a material basis and on an economic basis? Also, designing to minimize the supplemental heat usage, right? That's really the main impetus behind this. We're trying to basically reduce our reliance on, you know, propane, natural gas, all that kind of stuff, trying to stabilize that. So. The initial research questions as we went into this, um, how to optimize that heat gain in deep winter, how to retain that heat once it gets into the greenhouse, and then how to improve the construction detail. And I'll go into each of those. So first one, heat capture or heat gain. So a big thing, and this goes back to very basic, basic passive solar design principles. The most heat gain comes when the incoming rays are perpendicular to the surface, right? Basically, you get the most incoming rays possible. If you tilt this at all, you know, you kind of sacrifice how many actual rays hit this. So in the deep winter, we're trying to optimize this glazing angle for where the sun is in, you know, here, December, January, and October, and February, right? So basically one very simple but crucial design aspect is having this south glazing wall up at about 60 degrees, right? So we're trying to get as close to perpendicular to those incoming rays as possible. Um, one nice kind of side effect of that is that because we have a steep glazing angle, that allows us to get by with less structure. Because it's more vertical, it's dumping the snow down. We don't need to worry about snow load. Really, all we're worried about is some wind load, especially out on the prairie. But we can get by with much less structure, right? So this is an example. Um, this is about a 30 degree angle. Notice the depth of these, uh, I guess we'd call them rafters, more or less. Um, so these need to be pretty deep, and here they're on 24 on center. Um, some places will even do as small as 16. But basically, that winds up blocking direct rays from coming in if the sun is not perfectly, you know, directly south of it, right? But if we tilt that glazing angle up, all of a sudden we can get rid of a bunch of structure, thereby letting more heat, more, you know, rays directly into the space. So, kind of a nice effect. The other thing is this steep wall will also help reflect the rays in the summertime. So we're talking about that overheating issue, especially in the summertime. You know, I don't know if this would actually be used in the summer ever, but the idea being that when the sun gets high enough, it's literally gonna, the rays are gonna bounce off the glazing rather than penetrate into it. I'm gonna go back to one of Liz's slides for a second here, right? So this is the daily temperature graph of the conventional greenhouse, right? In these nice, Narrow bands. How'd they do this? How do they get such nice, even performance? Thermostat. A thermostat. Yeah, exactly. Right. But how are they doing this? They're heating it, right? They're heating it and venting it, right? 
And this one right here, this is all heat, right? This is all basically supplemental heat. These conventional greenhouses, they don't have any insulation, right? Necessarily. So all that heat is just gradually wicking its way out all night long. So we're burning stuff, essentially, right, to keep this nice profile here. The other thing that Liz brought up was that overheating component, right? We've got all this nice cold air in Minnesota, which we can make use of. But the thermal mass in the deep winter greenhouses also acts as a stabilizer for that top end as well. And I'll talk more about that in a second. So here's our performance of the deep winter greenhouse, right? And there's places where it's all over the map. Basically, what we're trying to do is stabilize this band with the very simple technology of the thermal mass. Okay? So once we get the heat into the greenhouse, how do we retain that heat? How do we keep it in? Two things. One is the thermal mass and then insulation. Those are our biggest ones, right? The other thing, as you probably all well know from being Minnesota residents, is air sealing, right? Sealing up our drafts. This is as simple as going around with the cot gun, right? Same principle applies to the greenhouse as it does to your home. Exact same principle, right? So I'll go into these in greater detail. First one is heat storage. Uh, the basic principle is that there is thermal mass, right? It absorbs the heat when it's available and then slowly re-releases it back into the space when it's cool inside, right? Basically, we're stabilizing those fluctuations, right? Trying to keep it within that narrow band. These are all different names for the same principle, right? And the nice thing about doing this research is that I've been able to look literally around the world at different types of designs. And it's amazing how many different places the same types of idea have cropped up independently, right? And so there have been all these, you know, different names for the same thing, essentially. So all this basically is the same thing. It's a thermal mass. It stores heat and gradually re-releases it to stabilize, right? So what do we see typically in the deep winter greenhouse is a rock bed, right? Why do we use rocks? Because, you know, some people talked about using water or historically there's been barrels of water placed in the greenhouses to, you know, absorb heat and stabilize the temperature. Well, when we're looking at such a small space, we want to try and use that space for production, right? We don't want to take up that space with barrels of water, right? So that's one thing. We want to try and move that thermal mass, you know, outside of the growing area. In this case, it's underneath. But why else rocks? Rocks are cheap. They're simple, right? There's not a whole lot that can go wrong with rocks. And as far as a transfer medium, right, how are we moving the heat to and from the rocks? Air. Why? Again, it's cheap and it's very simple to move. Unlike water, which, you know, another analog could be uh, like a radiant floor system where you have hot water heating going through, you know, a floor slab or something like that. It's a whole other system, right? Relatively complicated. We've got pumps. We've got, you know, fittings that are pressure sensitive. And if there's a leak, blah, 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 blah. You know, this is easy, right? So the basic design really is that we're moving air through that bed of rock, right? Very simple. How do we get the airflow through there, right? Essentially, we've got fans that are taking hot air from the peak of the greenhouse and then forcing it down below into ducts that are basically embedded within the rock bed, right? But the thing is we want to maximize the contact of air that's moving through there with the surface of those rocks, right? Basically, that's how we get that heat transfer, right, from the air into the rocks, and vice versa at night when the rocks are warmer than the air. We want to reintroduce it through the air. So how do we encourage that, right? And we want to maximize the use of that entire space, right? So one optimization, design optimization that we've come up with is that typically in the past, there's been kind of this duct layout, and then there's maybe a couple pipes that are just in the rock bed. It doesn't incentivize the air to actually move through all these kind of perimeter spaces or anywhere that's not a direct path from here to where that exhaust pipe is, right? We want to utilize, again, that full mass. So one optimization is to really intersperse the duct layout, okay? So we look at this as kind of these interwoven fingers where the hot air is coming down in here, gets injected, and basically this is perforated tubing both the blue and the red, right? In between that, about 12 inches of rock, right? If this is perforated the whole way, it's incentivized to want to move through that rock pretty much through the entire map, right? So there's one principle. Another thing is, basically, we want to try and 
allow the air to fully move through this space, right? A lot of what we've seen is that all the duct sizes are the same. This is a bad example because these are actually bigger, right? But the point being that you can only fit so much air or move so much air through, you know, a tiny duct. So it's important that we basically have this trunk of supply. It branches out, and it's able to supply all the various branches that are coming off of it, right? So we're going to see a gradual trend toward more of this trunk and branch system so that we're actually able to move those full amounts of air through the rock bed, right? The other thing about this is that we're using, generally using forced air. We're using fans to move the air through the rock bed. Anytime we have friction, essentially, you know, resistance to the airflow, that's more money for our fans, right? The fan has to work harder. And really, that's the only expense for the deeper in the greenhouse, right? Besides some supplemental heat. So if we can reduce that friction by the trunk and branch system, we're reducing our cost even more. Um, the other thing is duct fan placement. Um, typically, what we've seen in almost every design that I've seen is that the fan is placed on the supply side. It's trying to grab the hot air from the peak of the greenhouse and blow it down into the thermal mass, right? It's this light, fluffy air, right? It's hard to move. So one way to counter that is to actually put the fan on the cold side where the air is dense, sucking it, the cold air out, rather than trying to blow the fluffy hot air, right? More efficient return. Simple thing. So humidity in the greenhouse. Of course, we need humidity. It wouldn't be a greenhouse if it wasn't. Um, the good thing about humidity is that when it condenses from vapor into water, it gives off heat, right? So we get extra heat boost, basically, in the thermal mass when that happens. But the problem is we're concerned about indoor air quality, right? So, you know, the high-performance building guys, they're like, don't, you guys are recirculating air into this, you know, condensing mass underneath. Like, you, you kill yourselves, you know. Fortunately, there has been no recorded cases of indoor air quality problems in any of the deep winter greenhouses that I've seen, either in Minnesota or nationwide. But this is not a reason not to look closer into this. That's another area for study beyond this. Okay, so that's heat storage. Heat retention, the other thing, right? Once we've got it in the space. Talked before about insulation, where it is. Um, Greg introduced where it is in the perimeter, basically. The thing about insulation is that it's most useful when there's a big difference between, say, the indoor temperature and the outdoor temperature, or say it's you know, underground if it's cold air or cold ground and warm ground. It does. You know, it's worth the investment, essentially. In Minnesota, our frost depth is about 40 inches. It's changing depending on our snow cover, but we'll say that it's relatively stable at about 50 degrees at 40 inches below. Not, you know, when we're looking at our temperature graphs, basically the bottom temperature gets around about 50 degrees. So there's really no difference in the grind temperature and in the lower indoor temperature of our greenhouses at night. So it doesn't make sense to put insulation underneath our thermal mass. Just in the perimeter is where it's going to get really cold. So you can see here a couple examples of the perimeter insulation. This is Chuck and Carol's greenhouse. And then this is at uh, Lacropole Valley High School. And this is a nice example because they used an ICF, or an insulated concrete form. This essentially is the combined form work for the footing here, as you can see. And then it's got insulation both on the inside and the outside. It's in one handy dandy um, package. So insulation above grade. The north wall and the roof are the most crucial places to put the insulation because we don't get any thermal gain from the north side, right? The sun is never shining on the north side, so we want that to be well insulated. And the roof because that's where the heat's rising, right? We have the most thermal pressure. It's pushing up on the roof high. Same reason that we have more insulation in our attics than we do in our walls. Same kind of idea. So one part of the research was that uh, we hired some energy audits done. This was done by Sarah Hayden Shaw. She's an extension um, uh, employee uh, in northern Minnesota, also a certified uh, energy auditor. So that consists of basically a blower door test. That's basically a measure of how leaky the building is. Um, and uh, she did in, uh, infrared camera ratings or readings to show us where the drafts are, and then she gave a couple of recommendations. It was done on three farms, Elks Bluff and Monty, Vita Farm, Ryan's Farm, and uh, Paradox Farm in Ashby. So the good news from the energy audits is that the thermal mass is working. 
This shows, basically, we've got a ground temperature, the floor temperature of 79 degrees. That means that thermal mass has been charged up with heat from the day. This shot was taken in early morning when it was still cold out, right? Outside air temperature, 62 degrees. Inside air temperature, 71, right? So the ground, the thermal mass underneath, it's still the warmest part of this entire system at this point. So that was good. Good news. The other news, not so good, was that two of the greenhouses out of the three are drafty, all right? Basically, this shows, you know, if we're depressurizing, if we're sucking air out of the greenhouse, this is a measure of how much air is sneaking in all the cracks, okay? Unfortunately, um, yeah, the higher numbers indicate more drafts. So there is a big opportunity to really pay close attention to our air ceiling, right? So here's some shots of the IR camera. This shows basically where any of the drafts are. The, the darker colors here in each of these photos indicate where there's cold air infiltration. So a lot of opportunity to seal the thing up. However, one thing that we saw, especially uh, at Lita Farm, or I'm sorry, at Paradox Farm, was that they tried to seal it up, but then the sealant wouldn't grab on. So a little bit of research, we find out that there's only a couple of sealants that actually work well with the polycarbonate. But again, this is a crucial, you know, it's a little detail, but it's crucial to the performance, right? Because then we get full air sealant. Um, and briefly, I know we're up, running up against time here. Um, but minimizing the dangers of condensation. So we talked about the humidity before, right? Not only can it cause some indoor air quality issues, but we've seen a number of circumstances where, um, you know, where it's consistently collecting, where it's condensing on the inside of the glazing, we're going to get rot and mold and issues, you know? And so what's the point of building this durable <laughs> system if it's going to rot in four or five years, right? So simple details about how we can basically shed any water that's condensing and building out of durable materials, right? So that's resistant to the water, essentially. We want to be able to dry out as well. Um, so those are the main cruxes of where we are at right now. But some more uh, research for this project, um, more energy audits to really you know, get a better data pool, see you know, what's really working, how drafty is this stuff as it is. Um, and then uh, the indoor air quality issue. And this can be um, basically found out very quickly with a, a little sensor, a Petri dish, essentially, that will collect you know, indoor air quality samples, and then we'll test for microbes in there. And then the other last one, and this is a big one, uh, effectively integrating nighttime insulation, right? Because the glazing is great in the daytime when we're getting solar heat gain, but all of a sudden at night, it's a liability, right? It's the weakest point in the building envelope, and so we're hemorrhaging heat out of that at night anytime the sun isn't shining. So integrating nighttime insulation. So, and I have a couple samples if you want to take a look at that stuff. The deployment system needs to be figured out. So um, at the end of this project, basically what we're looking at is a narrative on the system selection, why we're doing what we're doing, um, the reasoning for those design aspects. So even if somebody diverges from the construction documents, they still understand the principles behind the design so that they can adapt it but still maintain those crucial details. Um, it'll be a construction document set attached to that for a modest size greenhouse. And the other thing about this is it'll be a standalone. A lot of the examples you saw is that it's attached to an existing structure. I'm hesitant to do that for a number of reasons. Um, so, you know, just to be on the safe side, um, it's for a standalone greenhouse. Um, we're designing it hopefully within the $15,000 range, and this is going to be Home Depot Menards prices, okay? Literally, just going to send them the whole materials list and get a real quote. Um, and that should be done by December 2015. So that's it. Um, for my part, I don't know if Greg, do you have anything more to say? We have Q and A in the back. In the oh, so this is the the basically the prototype construction document set that uh, is part of the the block grant um, by 2015. Or I'm sorry, by the end of December of this year. We'll have this whole document. It'll basically consist of a narrative, again, the reasoning behind the design considerations that are in that construction document set. It'll be set, a set of blueprints, essentially, but it will also be available as a Revit file. So if anybody you know, is really digging deep into the, exactly, yep, it'll be distributed by extension. Yep. So, so we, we might have time for a question to
So the question, just to repeat it for the recording, was uh, if you're building this in the city, how do you deal with ordinances, codes, um, all that kind of stuff? Honestly, <laughs> that's, a, that's an area that I would really prefer to look at later. You know what I mean? Maybe in the next two to three years. At this point, I really want to just try and optimize the basic design components, which is a, why we're doing it in the rural areas. Um, uh, I don't know, you know, I mean, depending on the use, I'm sure, you know, by code, this is an auxiliary structure. So I think you can get by with, you know, some, you know, basically some more wiggle room. Um, but, you know, as sending it by a, a city code official or something like that, that, that has yet to be done. So. No. We can send it to a structural engineer, though. I mean, all they need is the stamp, right? You are scared to death of Okay, so this is, comes with a lot of caveats. The question was, um, why wouldn't you do a greenhouse attached to a living structure or a living area? Um, and that is, again, this is the humidity issue. Um, time and time again, we see if you have a tight house, if, you know, if, say your, built was, your house was built in the past 30 years, for example. Um, any place, um, Basically, any humidity source in your house is going to concentrate the danger of condensation within your wall cavity, right? If you have any imperfections in the vapor barrier, basically, you've got a place where you're going to get water concentrating in either the structure or will be condensing in the insulation. Any place you'll have a dew point there, and that's when you get mold, rot, you know, structural issues then, right? The problem with attaching the greenhouse is that you're just generating so much humidity. Right? It's great as a sun space. I'm all for attaching a sun space to a living, you know, to a building, uh, you know, a house or something like that. But it's the high levels of humidity that we, you know, often see. It, it might be a different case with an old drafty farmhouse, right? Because then it's, you know, <laughs> you, it's breathing more, right? You know, so all that, that vapor, all that humidity has a chance to just kind of dissipate equally through the entire structure. It's when we have what was tried to be built as a tight house and there, there, I mean, and there's going to be slight imperfections, right? We can count on that. That's just, you know, as good as you build it, you know, there's still going to be some place where they miss, and that's where we're going to have the problem. So to avoid that kind of problem, you know, I just would prefer to stay standalone. It, you know, it also just defines, helps define the parameters of the project. It's better. Otherwise, it's so okay, custom. One more question, and then you're going to flag it down through the or the So the question was about thermal conductivity or heat capacity, maybe, about different types of rock. No. Um, basically, I mean, the, for the different rock, there's a very narrow band of differences in specific heat capacity. Um, when you get, you know, it's like there's water and there's ammonia, actually. Like, they have far greater, basically, water has almost twice as much heat capacity as rock does. But one thing to remember is that this is dissipated thermal mass, right? It's all rocks, but it has the, 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 the medium, the fluid, the air, has the ability to move pretty much equally through this matrix, right? The issue with other structures, you know, say it's a solid mass, it takes a long time for heat to work into that, right? So the nice thing about the rocks is that it's, you know, nice and dissipated. Generally, it's more of what's just locally available, you know? And a lot of times that's a washed river rock, you know? inch and a half river rock. So it's a nice balance between the size of the rock that allows the heat to, you know, fully penetrate and charge up each, each rock, um, you know, because if it gets much bigger than that, we're not getting the heat all the way in. So we don't, it's that thermal lag, the, the transfer going in and out of it. You know? So it's really more about what's locally available, you know, because we could use other materials. It's just like, where is it coming from? Or, you know, what's the, how complex is it as a system to try and charge? But yeah, the, that spectrum between different rocks is pretty narrow. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you.